we are so pleased to welcome you to the UBC Sauter School of Business, to our campus. Um, it's going to be a fantastic day and I'm excited to be your host. Um, we are um, going to be live streaming today's event. And so um, I'll give a little wave to those that are live streaming. They can't see you, they can see me. But if you raise your hand wide, they may see the back of your head. So feel free to give them a wave. We're really excited to be having folks from all around the world joining us today as well. I do want to acknowledge that we are gathered here on the land of the Musqueam people. This land is traditional, ancestral and unceded territory. I also want to acknowledge that our virtual participants that are joining us um, from many different places and take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of those lands. So our first speaker of the day, very excited to have him joining us. Um, Professor Darren Dahl has been the Dean of the UBC Sauter School of Business since 2022. So just getting started with us in his deanship um, over a year now and innovate VC professor in the marketing and behavioral science area. He grew up in Edmonton, Alberta and received his BCom in accounting from the University of Alberta. He then attended the PhD program in marketing at UBC and became associate professor at UBC in 2002. For the past 20 years, Darren's teaching and research has explored the fields of new product development, creativity, emotions in consumption, and social influence in marketing. His research has been presented at numerous national and international conferences, winning a number of awards, including the Killam Research Prize and a 3M Teaching Fellowship. In addition to his achievements in research and teaching, he is internationally sought after as a speaker who has held a number of visiting professorships at universities in the USA, Australia, the Netherlands, and Hong Kong. As a self-confessed Lego fan, volleyball coach, and motorcycle enthusiast, I know Darren to be an extremely positive and authentic person dedicated to both excellence within the school and building a community and connections, as many of you may have already experienced or will soon in the coming minutes. Um, so with that being said, I'd like to introduce you to our Dean of UBC Sauter, Darren Dahl. Welcome. It's uh, my great privilege to, to be here today uh, to give you a little bit of a taste of solder and why uh, why this might be the right choice for you. And, and I'm only going to spend, they, they give strict time, 10, 15 minutes, uh, to share some thoughts and then hopefully have a few minutes for question and then I'm going to pass the baton on to one of my colleagues. Um, but my goal is to just give you a little bit of flavor, give you a bit of understanding about, you know, solder and, and why this, why I'm proud to be here. I've been here 20 years. I was a graduate student here, as was noted. And it's, it's been an important decision for me. I've had lots of different choices. I've worked at HKUST. I've worked at Stanford. I've worked at Columbia. I've worked at a lot of different universities over my career. But I always kind of come back to Vancouver because it's a very special place. And I know many of you know that as well. The first thing I wanted to talk about is, is why. why. Why would you come back to school? Um, all of you have done the university thing, or most of you have done the university thing. I know there's a few of you that are, are looking at, uh, at the dual degree here, but why would you come back, right? And, you know, first off, I would hope you want to come back because you want to learn something. You love learning. But I've, I've learned that often that's not the number one reason to come back, right? Often we come back to see how we can advance ourselves, how we can improve, you know, ourselves in terms of our career. Many of you are looking to move up. Often I talk to MBAs or MMs or MBAs and they've reached a ceiling in their job and, and they're, they get passed over for promotion. And so this is an opportunity to jump that, to add to your skill set so that in your organization, boom, right? You can take that next step. That next promotion will actually land with you. So that's one great reason to come. A second is maybe you want to pivot. And often these are the MBAs that I talk to. They've been working in tech for a number of years and they realize I'm not happy. I need to change. And so this is an opportunity to do a reset, take a graduate degree and say, you know what, maybe there's something else out there. Maybe I want to work in government or a nonprofit, or maybe I want to work in transportation. Who knows, right? A grad degree enables you to pivot and alter the course or the pathway of your life. Another great reason. Some people do just want to learn, right? Sometimes it's, you know what, I've always dreamed of doing a graduate degree when I was younger. I wanted to do a first degree and I wanted to do a second degree. It's important to me to who I am. So that might be a third reason is that you just love. Learn Some people I know are addicted to learning. You're going to hear from Martina over here. She just won't go away, right? 
she did an MBA in 2011, 12. And I've tried to get her out of here, but she won't go because she loves learning. Every time I see her, she has another book, another learning opportunity to recommend to me. She's in considering now another degree, right? This is someone that loves learning, and that might be you. A last part may be just that social component. Sometimes people say grad degrees in business schools are about social, network, getting to find some friends. Probably I'll have friends, but that's another reason to do a degree, is to build that network. Find like-minded people. Find someone to start a business with. Make a link to an organization that maybe you want to work with. And that's what this school will give you. We have 50,000 alumni around the world. And part of the job of the dean is I travel around the world and I meet alumni. And they're always interested in students, helping students, helping other alumni. So by coming to a school like UBC, you're building that social network. So these are just some of the reasons why you might decide to do a degree. So I'd say one thing you should do today is kind of sit back and think a bit. You know, why? Why? Why do I want to do this? Where does this fit for me? Now, the second thing I wanted to share with you is, well, why UBC? Because that's really, I hope, why you're here. Maybe it's the free food outside. I respect, respect that. But maybe you're here because you're like, look, there's lots of choices. There's another school on a hill called SFU, right? we got some Royal Roads action, right? UVic. There's a Queens Pro. There's lots of different choices. So what I would share with you is why I've stayed at UBC why I think this is a great choice. It's the choice for everyone. And when you talk to our people, you'll understand that. For some of you, this is gonna be an amazing fit. For others, it might not fit, that's okay. But why I think this is interesting, or why you should consider this program, is four reasons, and I'll do them very quickly. First is, it's a global brand, okay? So if you have aspirations in your life, in your career, to take a degree, to do something at an institution that is known around the world as a top university, it, it is UBC. And I would say that's one of the best reasons to do, to do this degree. Yes, there's lots of different rankings, and you can look at rankings here in Canada. Typically, it comes between University of Toronto and UBC, Rotman, right? And Sauter always ranked as the, the top business schools. There's other good schools as well, but we are a global brand. One of my favorite evidence points is we're a member of GNAM the Global Network of Advanced Management Education. And this is an organization that has about 30 schools, and they pick one from every country that's going to be part of this elite group. The U.S. gets two, though, U.S. because <laughs> they just do. So they have Yale and Berkeley. U.K. has Oxford. Brazil has FGV. Hong Kong has HKUST. And these are top business schools around the world. In Canada, it's UBC right? Solder School of Business is part of this network that you have access to, right? If you take program here, because it's known around the world as an excellent business school where you're going to get top quality in terms of your education. So that might be one good reason is you want to put something on your Vita, your resume that says, look, this is an internationally recognized first class institution. And again, in questions, or if you want to follow up with me, I'm happy to talk more about that. Second is rigor, and I'm honest here, our programs are hard. If you wanna take a degree where you just show up and get coffee, right, and you don't have to do anything, that's not this degree. Whether you're taking an MBAN, an MM, or an MBA, right, our degree will push you. It's like going to the gym, except there's no real gym, okay? You're going to the gym to make you better. We're your personal trainers. Right? When you start complaining and saying, oh, it's too hard, we're like, add another plate. Right? Okay, not really, not really, not really. But we want to make sure that if you give us your dollars and tuition, we're making you better at the end of the program so that you can leave the program, right? And you can say, look, I started here, but this program took me to here. And that's the promise to you that it's a program that is going to be challenging. If it's not, why would you do it? Right? That's the way I see it. And if you have that attitude, then this is the right program across the spectrum of the grad programs for you. Okay, I just have to be upfront about that because sometimes people are like, hey, I just want to pay money and get initials. That's, that's not this program. Okay, You're going to learn a lot and, and we're going to push you. And that's fun. Third, wow factor. All programs pretty much teach the same thing. If you take an MBA, you take an MM, 
and MBAN, you're going to be learning some accounting, you're going to be learning some finance, you're going to be learning some marketing. They all do the same thing. So then what's the difference, right? How do you decide? Well, I've told you global brand, I've told you rigor. But the third is, do they have other things in the program that are a little different, a little interesting, right? I did a tour with some of you and I talked about the Creative Destruction Lab, the CDL program here. That's different. That's something that UBC has. SFU does not have that. Royal Rules does not have that. If you're interested in new venture, you can get involved with startup here at UBC, right? And learn what that means. Maybe that's a dream for you, right? We have courses that other programs don't have. We have a Solder Africa initiative where we take students, MBAs, undergrads, MMs to Nairobi. They work in the slums there to help build new venture. That's a wow factor, right? In the MM program, we have a community business project where you're working here in town for nonprofit to move the ball forward in our society. That's a wow factor, right? We have alumni coming in, right, to talk to our students. What's interesting to me is Ryan Beatty. You've heard the Beatty School in SFU. He's coming to talk to our MBAs in October. Why? Because he's an MBA grad from Sauter. You're like, well, why does he have the other school? Because <laughs> he did degrees at both. And he's proud of both institutions. And so one thing you should look for when you look at programs is what's different, what's interesting about that program that they offer, like a genie, right? Like a CDO, like a tech entrepreneurship, like a PMF society in our undergrad, right? And that can help make that decision for you as well because it offers things that other institutions don't. And to be fair, those institutions often offer things that we don't. So you want to make sure that you're picking an organization, an institution, a brand that fits well to you if that makes sense. The last one is community. And something that I'm proud of, and probably the biggest factor of what's kept me here at UBC, is the community. Now, a lot of people say, well, what do you mean by that, right? What I love about our grad programs is in each of the programs, it becomes a family, which is kind of weird, but it's true, right? I asked about four or five years ago, one of the MBA classes, I said, tell me one word that describes your class. And they said kindness. And I thought, that's weird. That's not a business school. Business school is competitive. Cutthroat. And like, no, stop talking. We care about each other. We're kind to each other. And maybe that's a West Coast thing. Maybe that's a UBC thing, right? But one of the reasons that I like being here is I know that I'm great friends with my staff, with my faculty, and with my students. I love going for coffee. And you'll find that most of, if not all of your professors are always willing to talk to you outside of class, to hang out a bit, have a beer, right? Collegial. Students bond together and they create relationships that last well beyond the program. And to me, that's pretty cool. It's meant to be more of a family program than it is to be a competitive program. So if you're someone that does like competition and you like to, Wolf of Wall Street, let's go it's probably not the right degree for you. I can name a few schools that you should go to. If you're more interested in supporting one another in a community and building yourself together with that community, this is a program that you should consider. So those are my four. I wanted to share with you a last little quote. It's a lot of, I never have text on my slides, but this was from an MBA alum a couple of years ago and she just, she pinged me on LinkedIn. I like to keep in touch. My LinkedIn's big. Keep in touch, this is an MBA, she's working in consulting, she's been out a couple of years. And some of the things, you know, she talks about. The word grit, who says grit? I don't know where she learned that. She's like, I say that word. But that's the rigor, right? I saw the best from others, that's community. And so when I get something like that in my box a couple weeks ago, it tells me why these programs matter. And it tells you what the opportunity is here. Now, it's our pleasure to host you today. You're going to get a sample class. You're going to get some free food. I like to call that tuition rebate before you pay it, right? And you have the opportunity to talk to some of our amazing staff who help, right? If you have questions, they're here for you. If you have questions for me, I'm more than happy to answer. I'm easy to find online. Send me an email. More than happy to help you in your decision, okay? I'm going to hold there because I'm at time, but I want to thank you all once again for joining us today. And I look forward to helping, if I can, in any way that I can to help you in your decision. So thank you so much.
for those of you that are online, please stay online. And um, uh, we'll be doing a question and answer with one of our student ambassadors, Jeff. And so please um, start submitting your questions and then we'll be back in about 15 minutes. So we're at 11.10, so around 11.25, um, we'll be back. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, everyone who's online, um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Uh, my name is Jeff Klumpus. I'm a full-time MBA student at uh, the UBC Sauter. Um, I'm starting my second year, so I've done um, one year of my MBA and I have four months to go. And um, yeah, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type it in the chat and uh, I will answer it. So we have 15 minutes here um, to, for me to answer questions. Uh, anything you want to know, whether it be about the program, about Vancouver, um, the, the floor is yours. So please uh, feel free to type in your questions and I'd be happy to, to answer them. Here we go. First question. How would you recommend someone getting back into school after a few years off? How is the workload? Okay. Yeah. Great question. Um, so for myself, um, I came from an engineering background. So I spent about eight years working as an engineer uh, after my undergrad before coming back to school. And yeah, I, I definitely had the same question. Um, I was a bit worried coming back into being a student again after working in the industry for so long. But what's great about this program, um, the, the full-time MBA program, is that everyone's basically in the same boat. So on average, I think um, the career experience people have coming into this program is um, seven or eight years. So I was kind of right in the middle and everyone's going through that same transition of work to school and the, the school knows it, the professors know it. So um, it was actually quite easy um, in terms of workload in your first and second terms. So in the fall of your first year, that would be the heaviest workload. And it is um, quite a large workload. Um, but at the same time, you're just learning so much. You're learning how to be a student again. Um, there's a lot of group assignments. So you're working with a bunch of different people from different backgrounds. So there is a lot of work to do, but the amount you learn in just four months um, in those first two terms is, is amazing, especially coming from industry. If you felt like you've kind of plateaued in your career, just to be able to learn again and learn so much is, um, yeah, it, it's very motivating. All right. There's a lot of questions coming in, so I'll try and uh, speed up and get to all of them. How the professional MBA works. Um, so I, I, I can't speak to that as much um, because I'm a full-time MBA student, but the professional MBA is you're, you're taking similar courses, but they would be on um, evenings um, and on the weekends as well. So you'll have some class with full-time MBA students if they're doing weekend courses or evening courses, but for the most part, you'll just be with the other PMBA students. Um, and then I believe there's also a, a there's like one week um, a term or every four months. Again, I'm not completely sure where you come in and you do like several uh, days of classes in a row. Um, but you should be able to find out more about that program um, online on the, um, the RHL website. Um, but yeah, myself, I can't speak to that as much just because I, I know more of the, the full-time MBA. Um, next question is what kind of courses are you taught? For someone looking to build a career in strategy and you, could you please name some professors who take classes in the field of strategy? Um, okay, yeah, so um, you'll do uh, in your first two terms, actually, you do a course called Business Strategy and Integration. Um, the professor's name for that is um, Sabrina Ray. Um, and yeah, so you'll get exposure to a lot of cases. Um, you'll have like a lot of written cases. And then as well, you'll do a live industry case. So you'll work with a, a Vancouver-based company. And um, then as well for my year, uh, we did a, present, a case presentation for Lululemon. So we were assigned a case. And then um, the corporate staff from Lululemon came in and um, we presented to them, which was like very cool. Um, and then the group they thought gave the best presentation uh, won a prize. So it was just a great, great way to network as well. You get to meet and talk to the staff who are working in that uh, retail sector at like a, a huge global company like Lululemon. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of strategy classes. Um, there's these been like operations. There's a professor called Chris Ryan who teaches an operations and strategy class. And that's just an incredible course. Um, yeah, I can only say great things about the, the professors here. Um, a lot of them come from extremely reputable schools and uh, yeah, it, it's very interactive. Next question is the GIE. Yeah, so that's a, a major highlight for the MBA program, the full-time MBA program. So basically in November, 
of your first year, they will announce four destinations. For my class, it was uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, Madrid, Spain, and Cape Town, South Africa. And so you pick which uh, country you want to go to. Um, and then generally you get your first or second pick, depending on how many people want to go to each country. And then you're assigned a consulting project for a company that's based in that city. And you work for about two months in, in, uh, on campus with your group before traveling to that destination. And then you spend two weeks there um, doing uh, lectures at the, the university um, there. And as well as you'll be working with your client. And at the end of those two weeks, you do a final presentation to your client um, on the project. Um, and yeah, it's just, for me, it was the highlight of the MBA. It's just amazing. Uh, I went to Cape Town, South Africa. So just to travel uh, with your classmates, um, the workload when you're there, if you do a lot of work in advance, it's not super intense workload while you're there. So you have evenings to explore the city, go out for dinner with your classmates. Um, it's just an incredible time um, and a great way to also meet people in the industry um, in other countries. How would you recommend someone to focus when we feel like quitting? I'm guessing that's the question. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is, yes, there are times in the MBA where it's, it's quite stressful, but um, knowing that everyone's in it together and everyone's going through the same thing is what motivates me. And yeah, just you make great friendships, um, both like personally and professionally, and everyone I found supports each other. So as long as you put in the effort, um, you're, you're, the other students recognize that and um, They'll, they'll, they'll help you out. So I think you'll be fine. Um, there might be times when you somewhat feel like uh, quitting, but you know, nothing, um, nothing comes too easy, especially like big accomplishments. You're going to face some um, adversity and challenges, but um, you have your, your whole course um, courses there to, to learn from. And then your whole cohort there to like support you and uh, help you through it. So I think you'll be fine. Um, what is expected out of a candidate looking forward to apply full-time? I'm not exactly sure what you mean. Um, what, what is expected out of a candidate? Um, if it's terms of the application, um, I can't speak to that so much. That's more of a question for the recruiting team, but, uh, I would just say, yeah, be passionate about, um, whatever it is that you're, you're looking to go into, um, be passionate about learning, um, making new connections, learning from others, embracing new cultures and um, professional backgrounds. Uh, that would be my advice. What can I do to make myself a great applicant for this program? And is the GMAT or GIRE better to write? Again, that's I can't really speak to recruiting. Um, that's that's separate. Um, I think yeah, just to stand out is like be yourself, be be authentic. Um, be who you are. I think they love creativity. Um, they love um, people who are genuine. So um, yeah, that would that would be my advice. Um, but yeah, I, I can't say what's better, GMAT or GRE. Um, yeah, because that's a that's a recruitment question that uh, I don't have the answer to. Um, admission interview again. I, all I can say is, um, from my experience, just be yourself. Um, as an ambassador, I, I don't have access to any additional um, recruitment information. Those are questions for the rec recruiting staff. But I would say, yeah, uh, be yourself. Um, come, be open to, to new ideas. Um, show that you're you're willing to learn. That you're excited to come. Um, and then, yeah, also think about why you're choosing Solder compared to or NRHL compared to other business schools in Canada. And um, yeah, how you think you could. Uh, contribute positively to your cohort clubs and extracurricular within uh, RHL uh, from Lima, Peru. Wow. Uh, yeah. Great question. There are many clubs um, that are run by students throughout the, uh, the MBA program. So just for instance, we have a movement and mindset club, which focuses on, we do some hikes, uh, meditation activities. Uh, we go down to the beach um, as well as there's a, a sports club, so uh, we sometimes they go bowling, play basketball. There's a diversity, equity, and inclusion club. Um, there's a beer club. So we meet down on the beach and have uh, beer from time to time, which is one of the more popular clubs uh, in the MBA program for sure. Um, what other clubs are there? Uh, there's a finance club. Um, so they'll organize um, networking activities. Um, so you might go to a, a bar and there'll be a bunch of alumni who are graduated and working in finance jobs. So it's a great way to network. Same with the entrepreneurship club. They have, uh, they bring in entrepreneurs from the area 
to uh, to give talks and uh, mini lectures. So there's there's many clubs to to choose from, um, and and you don't have to like join a club really. You kind of just you join their WhatsApp group, and if you're interested in the event, you you just show up to the event. Um, and most of them are free. Some of them have like a ten dollar ticket, especially if it's some of the events downtown because they'll have to book a venue. But it's definitely worth it because you get free snacks, usually a free drink, and then tons of uh, time to network with colleagues in the industry. Toughest challenges? Um, I would say, yeah, it's, it's, it's managing your time. So you're going to have a lot of work to do and you're going to have a lot of different groups to work with and just being able to get everyone's schedules aligned so that you have time to work with your group um, and making sure that you're not neglecting one group to work for another group because you'll have different groups in different courses. Um, so I would say, yeah, just time management. It is a heavy course load. I don't find the content was too difficult. Um, some of the corporate finance I found was a little more difficult in terms of content. But um, again, your other students are there to support you. Students will put on um, like tutorial sessions as well. So if someone's got a strong accounting background, they might say, hey, I'm in this room. I'm going to give like an hour long uh, question and answer period. Um, I'd show up to that. Uh, so yeah, the students really are there to support you. But I would say workload is definitely one of the challenges. But um, I mean, that's it's it's how you learn as well. Um, the GRE wave, waiver, I, I, again, I can't answer that. That's an admissions uh, and recruitment question, so I, I won't speak to that. Annual salary coming out of um, uh, the UBC MBA. That's that's a good question. Um, I believe for. I don't know if they've published the data for last year's cohort, but the year before, um, so two years before my year, um, the average uh, salary was, I think it was just under a hundred thousand Canadian dollars a year. Um, and that varies quite, quite drastically. Um, some people are looking to gain more experience. So they may go into a job that's paying uh, as low as like $60,000 a year, whereas others um, land jobs in like finance or um, consulting where it could be upwards of $150,000 a year. So it really depends, but I think the, the median is around just under 100,000. Why did I choose UBC? Um, I, I, I knew I wanted to do, I was um, working as an aerospace engineer. So I just found that I was, my career path was quite laid out for me. It was becoming more and more technical. And every year it went on, I'd have less of an ability to pivot into a new um, career if I wanted to. So that's why I chose the MBA because it's, it's a very generalist degree and it allows you to, to go into so many different industries because you get such a broad range of skill sets. And UBC, uh, I have to say Vancouver, the city itself was a major draw. Uh, I'm a big time skier. So in the winter time, um, I didn't have class on Fridays in the my third and fourth terms. So myself and quite a few other um, students, we would go to Whistler almost uh, every Friday when we could, when the workload wasn't too high. So yeah, the, the beaches, the ocean, um, the hiking, the mountains, and then the skiing were big draws for me, as well as the sustainability program at, uh, at UBC Sauter was another huge draw because it's, uh, I, I find it's it, they're, they're right on the leading edge of um, the um, sustainability with business mixed in. So how to be not just more sustainable, but how to be more profitable by implementing sustainability, which is something that was uh, very um, important to me and something I found very interesting when I was here. Would you recommend someone from Toronto come to this MBA over doing one from Toronto? Benefits and opportunity. Uh, I think that depends what you want to do. Obviously, it's it's no secret. Uh, there are more job opportunities in Toronto if you're looking at um, some of the big four consulting or finance. Um, at the same time, though, if you're looking into like product or tech, there's a ton of availab availability in Vancouver. I myself came from Toronto um, and... Um, yeah, I, I decided to come to Vancouver. Um, as I said, one, the city, and two, the sustainability. And then also, like, my internship was in Toronto this summer. So even coming out here, you still have access to that Toronto market. There were several other students who did internships in Toronto as well, um, some at RBC, some at uh, IBM. So you still have, because nowadays, like, all the information sessions, too, are online. Um, you can apply online. So a lot of the postings for internships were in Toronto as well. And uh, I know every year people uh, graduate, go to Toronto 
too. Um, is it advisable to email a prospective supervisor before you start your application? Um, yeah, again, that's more of a um, recruitment question. Uh, I'd say it's always good to, if you have questions, to, to reach out to um, the admissions teams or the recruiting teams. Um, and then again, attending sessions like this, uh, asking questions during sample lectures, I think is a great way to, um, to be recognized and show that you're interested in, um, and you're paying attention in lectures, which is obviously very important, but, uh, yeah, I, I can't say too much about, uh, admissions. One, one more, one or two more minutes. Okay. Um, wow. There's a lot of questions here. Uh, how is the structure of MBAN different? Um, so which of these programs is the right fit for you considering a career in strategy consulting? I think either would be good. MBAN, you do more um, programming and analytics courses. Um, so you'll do like more Python courses. Um, but yeah, that's, that's all I can say to that. I'm going to try and skim through very quickly. How much money did you spend, I guess, on GIE? Um, so you do pay for it yourself. With flights and hotel, for me, it was about three and a half thousand Canadian dollars. Um, maybe a bit under that. Some students doubled up, so two to a room, and they saved an extra thousand. So I'd say anywhere between like 2,500 and three and a half thousand um, would be the extra cost of that. But it's, it's, it's so worth it because it, it's such an amazing time. Um, it could actually be lower. Some of the flights to Europe I know can be cheap as well, and it depends on the destinations. Work experience do a candidate require? Um, I know for the MBA program, minimum is two years. I think on average, it's about yeah six to eight years. Custom track, yeah. So could you provide some names of financial institutions that hire from UBC? Um, I know RBC hires, um, TD hires. Uh, there's a few boutique um, investment banking firms that students have gone to as well. Brand management and marketing. Is this an option to gear? Yeah. So there's a, yeah, there is that track. Um, Joey, who just spoke to you, uh, is an amazing marketing professor. She was my marketing professor. So yes, marketing is covered. How do you feel your engineering background contributes to your diversity of your cohort? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. There's a ton of different professional backgrounds um, within the, the program, ranging from musical theater to law to biology, food science, engineering, uh, finance, accounting, hotel management. So yeah, what's amazing too is you work in groups who of people who come from such different career backgrounds and you're able to leverage those skills um, to the benefit of your group. How to study more and focus less on other things? Uh, I think that's a question you have to ask yourself that. Um, really, it's prioritizing what is important to you. Um, so I'd say that. Culture at UBC based on your interaction with community. Yeah, I think the culture here is, is, is very strong. Um, the, the student group here is very supportive. Um, I, I've heard some other MBA programs are very competitive between the students, but I haven't found that at all. I find everyone so eager to help everyone else. And when someone lands a job or an internship, there's everyone's very happy for them. Um, so I find it's a very supportive cohort. Uh, they advised me to shift my idea of pursuing MBA since they lack the funding, but this is hard for me to accept since the MBA is... How true is that... They advised me to shift my idea of pursuing MBA since they lack. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really understand what that question is. Um, Daniel, maybe if you can quickly rephrase it. Oh, I think you have rephrased it. Grants and scholarships. Yeah, so in terms of professional MBA, I, I, I don't know about the grants and scholarships. I know there are grants and scholarships available. Um, but I, I don't know specifically for the professional MBA. So that'd be a question to ask the uh, recruitment team. Oh, great. Yeah. So um, Vivian, great, is posting some information. Yeah, Joey, thanks, Vivian. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think I'm uh, being cut off now. But thank you, everyone, for your uh, your great questions. Um, hopefully, I was able to to answer those. Um, you can find me. My name's Jeff Klumpus, J-E-F-F-C-L-U-M-P-U-S. Hello, everyone. We're going to get started again. If you can take a seat. Wonderful. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the coffee break.
And for our virtual participants, I was seeing there was lots of questions flowing in for our ambassador, Jeff, if you had a chance to meet him earlier. So thank you, Jeff, in the virtual space. He's actually in a little room out there, <laughs> has been uh, madly answering the questions coming in from our live stream. Um, so we have more programming for you before we head off for lunch in about... Um, Long, uh, closer to one o'clock. Um, and so really excited. We've got some more great speakers for you. Um, so our next session will be presented by Martina Valkovica. Um, I will give a little intro to her as well. Um, but Martina will be talking about careers and she is a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of a network, I will say as well. Um, just a little bit of personal uh, connection to knowing what Martina is all about. Um, Martina Valkovica is the Assistant Dean and Director at the Harry B. Varshney Business Career Center here at Daughter, where she leads a team of passionate individuals who help students discover their career aspirations and prepare for their professional journey. She is a very proud UBC Sauter MBA alumna, which Darren mentioned before, from the class of 2011, I believe it was. She was born in Slovakia, a small country in Europe, in a village of about 500 people. Her dream from a young age was to travel across the world, and it has certainly come true. So far, she has lived, studied, and worked across three continents, Europe, Africa, and North America, visiting about 30 countries along the way. Her leadership career spans over 20 years and includes establishing European employment services in her home country, coordinating an IPO for an airline, and running an agency supporting entrepreneurs with a $250 million portfolio. She loves learning and has also um, obtained a master's degree in economics, speaks four languages, and is currently learning Korean. Books and reading play a large part in Martina's life, and she aims to read about 100 to 150 books every year. So if you are a fellow reading nerd, she definitely wants to hear from you. When not reading, you can find her on long walks, writing poetry, meditating, and watching lots of tennis and cycling. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Martina. Thank you. Right. This one. I think I've got this one, right? <laughs> okay. All right. So in 2008, I was in your shoes. I was choosing which program am I going to go to? And I, you know, did a lot. I've always wanted to live in Canada because how many of you know the book Anne of Green Gables, the good old Canadian classic? Yeah. You can see a few hands, not too many, but few hands. Yeah. Hence the red hair. And that's why I wanted to live in Canada from a very early age. So it's all about books for me. Um, and, um, you know, I did my research and I have to say that. UBC Sauter actually changed completely the life of my career and my trajectory. I never thought I'm going to um, do my career in education after my MBA. Some people actually laugh at me. Shouldn't you go like from public sector to private sector after your MBA? But no, it was actually a um, really life-changing experience. And I I'm just going to let you in on a little secret. Many of you, and we'll do that exercise in a second, might want to come and do your MBA because you want career advancement, right? You want the upskilling. I can see some heads nodding. Here is the thing. I did not know what I want to do until the last week of my MBA. And this is how it went. I was having a conversation with our former dean and he was asking me, Martina, what are you going to do? You haven't shared anything with us. Like, where are you going? Like after this, you know, MBA, I was a pretty engaged student. And at that moment, I got these absolutely few seconds of clarity that maybe come to you only a few times in your life. And I looked at him and I said, I want your job. And he said to me, don't, don't do that job. It's a really bad job. And Darren could actually tell you, right? But it made me realize because I was always about impact and influencing people's lives and developing people. I've done leadership positions for a very long time. And I realized that education is something that provides with all of that, right? So I decided, okay, I'm going to have a career in education. And yes, Darren cannot get rid of me. And it's his fault because I love his creativity class. Um, he was a ph phenomenal professor and he taught us a lot. And why would you leave a place where you're surrounded by awesome students, great faculty like Joey, and a lot of books, right? So I'm like, no, I'm staying. And it's also his fault because he just proposed to me to do an interdisciplinary PhD. So I'm like, oh, okay, we'll see about that one. But I've got, so what we're gonna do now is a little exercise. So I want you to take out your phones. I will let you do, okay, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit. And we're gonna use Slido. I think many of you know Slido. 
So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here to kind of like see what's the audience that I'm working with here. But the question is, think about it. Why do you want to do, why, why did you come to Soda? Why do you want to do a master's degree? I want to see what's the audience. What are we working with here? So you can both use the code and you can use the, um, uh, go directly to the website. So you can put as many things in there as you want. I set it up that you can have two, three answers. So let's see what's going what's gonna to come up. You're going to be answering this question. Upskill, okay, multiple career change, expand opportunities, okay, building a new network, career change, a lot of career, career advancement, career change, a lot of stuff there. Learning, okay. Make a difference in my workplace. Nice. Inv advance my skills. Yes, yeah, so I've got some dream. I love that dream. Well, let me tell you, they will not let you dream during the classes. It's going to be a lot of hard work. Pivot. Um, career pivot. But there is definitely, so as I predicted, there is a lot of career advancement why you want to do a master's degree. Uh, for example, in a full-time MBA, we tend to have quite a bit of engineers, right, who want to get out of that subject matter expertise, and they maybe want to move into leadership positions, so to learn a little bit more about that. But, but there is a lot. There is a lot about career. And that's what my team does at school. Each and every one of you is going to have a dedicated coach when you come to your master's program. There's going to be different ones for different program. Some of you will have career courses. Some of you will have a lot of workshops. So there is a very robust support for you in your career advancement and career development, because here is the thing you will have to dedicate a lot of time to your career development, just like you're going to do it for academia. There is no such thing that you're gonna do a master's degree and somebody will say, oh, here is a job on a silver platter. That does not happen. You will have to go and network. You will have to build relationships. You will have to do things that you might have not done before, okay? So let's look at the second question that I've got here for you. What are the skills you think that the employers are looking for? Some of you might be already hiring managers. So think about it. What do you want in your people? What are the things that employers are looking for the most? What do you think? Leadership, experience, personality. Yeah, okay. Communication, adaptability, compassion. Okay, leadership is a huge one. Communication is a big one. Teamwork. Covering it pretty well. Okay, let's give a few more seconds. Okay. All right, some good stuff that you've covered in here. We're going to switch. We're going to, do you want me to um, stop sharing? Okay. So there is a lot of good stuff in there. So we are living in something that we call Industry 4.0. It is very different than what the industrial revolution was before. We've got AI, we've got technology, a lot of questions about what it actually makes us human, right? What's the difference? Are the robots going to overtake our jobs? So let's, yeah, I can see some people smiling, right? Am I, with a master's degree, am I actually going to have a job in a knowledge economy or is there gonna be a chatbot that's gonna overtake us? Well, here is the thing. My opinion on all of that is that in a knowledge economy, if you won't know how to use those technologies, you're not going to be competitive. People are still going to be needed for very advanced, for very advanced things, but you will need to know how to use AI. You will need to know how to use chat GPT or all of those things that are out there, BARD and, and all of that stuff. So let's have a look. I kind of like divided the skills because we had that major pandemic. You remember that? Yeah. Um, so I kind of divided it into pre-pandemic and post-pandemic, right? But here is the thing, skills that are most desired, you look at any reports that are out there, whether you look at World Economic Forum, whether you look at academic research, critical thinking, and especially now it's coming up, problem, problem solving, but a very complex one because we are gonna be living or we are already living in a very complex world. What we've seen as a trend coming up actually this year, that they're almost combined and people want creative thinking, right? They want people to be really creative to distinguish themselves from anybody else. 
what was coming up before my pandemic and will remain social emotional skills are definitely important are you going to be a good colleague each and every one of us spends about eight hours plus in our jobs will they want to have a coffee with you yeah that's fine that you can like be excellent in excel spreadsheets or do something different but are you going to be a good teammate right so i would like to really highlight communication skills and ability to analyze and interpret data communication skills hands down always among the top three skills that the employers are looking for. And we'll talk about it a little bit later. Now, any job that you will go to, you can be a brand manager, you can be a marketer, you can be an analyst, you can be whatever you choose. Everybody assumes that you will have the ability to interpret and analyze data because we are living in the world of big data, right? And here is the stuff that was really coming up after the pandemic, and you actually covered it um, in your suggestions or your ideas. Definitely flexibility, adaptability, a lot of employer-specific skills. A lot of employers will tell us, don't worry, we will teach them the technical side. I just need them how to think. I need them to communicate. I need them to be a team player, right? And I need them to have the attitude. I think that one of the words that was out there was personality. So the attitude actually really matters. And lifelong learning, and I will close up with that one. Lifelong learning, you think you're going to have just master's degree? No, you will have to constantly and constantly upskill because there is new stuff that's coming our way all the time, okay? We have a method to our madness in the career center, and we actually developed our own career development model. And if I kind of like big bang of what Joey said, this is where you're going to be creating your own brand, right? How are you showing up in class? How are you showing up to your classmate? Do you have a reputation that somebody would actually introduce you to their connection for a job? So at the center of it is know yourself, and we will do a little exercise in a few seconds knowing yourself, who are you? What do you have to offer? What are your values? What are your strengths? How are you unique from everybody else? How are you gonna sell it to people? How are you gonna tell your story? Number one feedback I'm getting from employers is that students are sometimes overprepared and too robotic, and they don't know how to tell their unique story and what do they offer to, to employers. So let me give an example. If I go and go for an interview and if they ask me, what do they need to know about me? I will always tell them that one thing that they need to know about me is that my number one value is freedom. Why is that the number one value? When I was growing up, I was growing up in what was former Czechoslovakia and it was a communist country. I never thought I'm going to get out of there. My number one thing, what I wanted was freedom and that freedom translates into how I lead people. I'm not a handholder. I am not a micromanager. I'm going to give you goals. I'm going to give you vision and a direction. You go and figure it out how you want to do it. So what are you selling? What is it? What's your unique story that made you you? You need to know what are you selling to the employer. You're going to learn a lot through experience. Some of you are going to have internships. Some of you are going to have hackathons. A lot of case, lot of cases. Some of you are going to do case competition. If you do decide to do your master's degree, participate, okay? There's gonna be a community business project. You will learn a lot with that hands-on experience, right? And we actually have in the Career Center an entire business development team that provides support and brings in projects and employers that we work with. And then the last piece, explore career opportunities. You will have to do research, just like, again, I'm gonna to point to Joey, just like you do research about the brand, you will have to do research for who is out there? Who is the employer that actually is really good for you, right? A lot of people look at the big brands and not to kind of like, you know, um, say anything bad about big brands, but their culture might not suit you. You might be more entrepreneurial, so you might be more suited for a startup or a company that's in a rapid growth because that's where your skill set is, right? This is one question that I always ask at every one of my sessions, and I want you to just throw numbers at me. If I just gave you pen and paper or, you know, like 20 minutes and you couldn't use Google or any search engine, how many companies would you be able to tell me that you know? 20, 50, 100? Give it a few seconds and shout numbers at me. How many would you know? 50? Yeah. Hmm? 100? 
Anybody 200? No? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, here is the thing. A lot of the time when students come here, they only know a few. You know the brands that you use, you know your Coca-Colas, you maybe know the McKinsey's, you know Meta, right? You know some of those big brands. Here is the thing. In Canada alone, there are about 1 million companies that have employees, 1 million. And we are not even talking about government and NGOs and charities. So there is a whole world out there that you can explore, okay? So right now, we're gonna do a little exercise. So we can pass on, I think that people have a, um, have it also online, so we can um, provide it for them. And I've got, we've, we've got something which is called your unique career journey worksheet, where we actually assess how prepared you are as a part of your journey. So I, I brought in the first two, know yourself and tell your story. And I would really like you to honestly assess yourself, honestly assess yourself where you are at, at this point of your life. And just be truthful, you're not gonna show it to anybody, it's just going to be for yourself to really think about when you come to a master's degree, where are you at? Okay. So what basically, there are little squares there and where you can say, I am confident about that piece. I have opportunity to grow or I am unsure. So let's give it maybe about five, 10 minutes. Look at it and assess yourself. Let's debrief a little bit about this one. So who, who would like to volunteer? Was it easy? Was it hard? Did you put confident in all of them? Is there anybody who would like to share? Yeah? Hi, my name is Nidhi. I have uh, completed this form. And um, when it comes to the first column on my career interests and goals, I have kept confident because I'm clear on those. Mm -hmm. Uh, when it comes to my smart career goals, um, some are confident, some are mm. opportunity for growth and some are unsure also. <laughs> One's unsure actually, which says achievable, realistic and doable. So mm -hmm. That's like unsure. <laughs> um, when it comes to a career mindset, uh, developing a career mindset, it's um, it's like a 50-50. Uh, emotional intelligence is opportunity for growth. <laughs> And um, the other two are confident. Yeah, and my story, resumes and cover letters, unsure. <laughs> um, interviews and coffee chats, confident. Okay. Effective online presence, unsure. Unsure. Okay, wow. So there is still, just like with the upskilling, there is still some work to do, right? Okay. Is there anybody here who actually is, you know, I you would have my respect who put confident in all of them? Confident in all of them? Because then I will just get you as a volunteer and you could work with our students, right? That would be awesome. But yeah, it's a lot to think about. When you think about your career, when you come to the master's program, it's not, you're going to be stretched. It's not only about the academia. You have to really think about, you know, what is it out there? You might come with a certain perception and then you're going to be discovering all of these things about you. We have tool for all of them. We are actually one of the only schools in the world who provides emotional intelligence training for all of our students, both undergrads and grads, because that's what the employers told us, that they want our students to really be proficient in. And so we're going to have tools for all of this. So now who can tell me kind of like, as you were going through that exercise, did it really kind of like pop thoughts in your head what's unique about you? And as I was telling you that story, I can see some smiles. Anybody would like to share? share little stories, share something um, about them that really impacted them or it's important to them. Hmm. It's scary to be to put yourself out there to be vulnerable, right? It's true. Like, yeah, <laughs> all right, we've got one. But like, you, you inspired me because I come also from a country where I grew up, uh, I'm Tunisian, so I grew up uh, like everything is pre-made and pre thinked for you. So uh, there is a lot of hierarchy and you have to respect uh, everything, pre like uh, all your future and everything is expected to do it because you are a female, because uh, uh, like the, all the society and the government uh, rules and coming here to Canada, it's the freedom to choose. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's scary because you don't grow up on it. 
Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely scary. And thank you, thank you. I really appreciate that you shared. Yeah, it, it is scary, but here's the thing. You will have to really, I love the little one. He's like starting from there. She's starting from the beginning. He's like, yep, gonna be here. I'm contributing already from a young age. I'm gonna do a BCom here, then MBA and then PhD. Um, so we want you to think about, you know, what are the company values? Are they aligned with your own? Because we've seen students who are like, I'm going to go for a big brand. And then six months later, I have them back and they're broken. They're like, I don't like the people I'm working with. It's too competitive, right? I like the environment that's a little bit more collaborative, right? Those are some of the things that we really want you to think about. What are the strengths? Can they really, are you going to have a good manager, right? I would argue out of all of the things that you, that you want for your career, you want a good pay, you're going to fulfilling role that, you know, it's going to be purposeful. Um, you want a good manager, you want good colleagues, right? I would say for your first job after graduation, the manager is the most important. That's going to be your next reference. Is it going to be a person who's going to develop you, right? All of those things we want you to think about as you're choosing your next step in your career. And here is the thing. Um, we actually did a little exercise with our students. Um, and we actually uh, put two job descriptions, very similar roles. One was for a big consulting company, Global, and one was for a really good national company in Canada. So when you had the brand out there, when you saw the names, 80% of the students apply for the big international brand. When we took away the brands and just left the, the job title and the job description, 50-50. 50-50. So think about it. Think about what you want from your career, right? Just like what you think um, you want from the academic degree. Okay. And here is, I always put this slide as the last one, because I just don't think that anybody has actually said it better than this gentleman, Alvin Toffler. What he said is, it's going to be all about learning, unlearning, and relearning for the rest of your life. You, in 21st century, that's how you're going to be successful. So if you're an international person coming to Canada, you will have to actually unlearn how your market works and how do you get jobs there. You will have to learn what you know, coffee chats and informational interviews are and how to build relationships. We actually have a whole workshop um, that I do on building relationships. We've got an, um, a whole one on the EQ as well. You will have to relearn things, right? Some of you might be out of school for a while, right? You will have to actually relearn how to do assignments and how to work on a team in the academic setting. So it's gonna be constantly, you're gonna be constantly in this cycle. But I will say, as I said at the beginning, sort of did change my life. I am a huge champion. And I will just kind of like, you know, end it with a story of what Darren was talking about, about community. And that's certainly one of the things that I appreciate here the most because I talk to my counterparts in a lot of other universities and sort of is unique in that sense. The collaboration that we have access to faculty and to, to other staff and to students. And the story that I wanted to say I do not know a dean in another business school who would take the entire staff and faculty by teams to his house for a barbecue and would be grilling meat and grilling vegetables for, for their team and just build a community so people actually can collaborate with each other. So I really hope I'm going to see many of you um, in the respective program that you're going to be applied for. I'm not able to stay for lunch because I have prior appointments, but if you have more questions, connect with me on LinkedIn. And here is the last tip at the end. Don't just ever send, connect. Send people a personalized message. Who doesn't send me personalized message stays in the queue or is rejected. Your chances of actually adding somebody to your network are much higher when you just actually send them a message why you want to connect with them, especially if they don't know you, okay? So I did carve out a few minutes for questions. If there are any questions that anybody would like to ask that are related to the topic we've talked about. Anybody's curious about anything? Yeah, go for it. How does the MBA curriculum have evolved pre-pandemic and post-pandemic from a curriculum perspective, not just the online Oh, yeah, for pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And you're asking specifically for the MBA program? For the PMBA program. Yeah. Oh, on many levels. So I, I'm not the best expert and our kind of like MBA colleagues can say, but here are the few things. We know that we live in a, in a world of great change and pandemic definitely contribute to it. So, for example, for the MBA, we started a climate track. 
a new climate track. The other thing is that every syllabi now, now has the United Nations development goals and how is everything actually tying what our professors are teaching. So I'd say that that's on the academic level to be, it's all about responsibility to society. Our dean, a new one, is Darren, is really unveiling a new strategic plan. And at the top of it is like, how are we all collectively actually going to be responsible to society? So that's on the academic side. On the career side, we've certainly seen a lot of changes, what the employers are asking for, how the interviews are done, right? Pre-pandemic, everything was in person. Now you might have a first interview just purely on Zoom. You might not even have an interview. You might have to do a video and they only then invite you for an interview. So the pandemic has definitely shifted a lot of things when it comes to recruitment, for sure, and also when it comes to academia. So I don't know if anybody from the MBA team would like to add anything around, Rodrigo, about the changes in the program. In terms of curriculum evolution and how the MBA and the school, the MBAN, and the Masters of Management programs are evolving, we have seen things like the technology analytics track being implemented into the MBA. Into the MBAN, we are seeing the increase and more interest in terms of storytelling. How are you actually unpacking data analysis and data analytics and building narratives that can help drive strategy? With EMM, we see an expansion of some of the CBP, community-based projects, really aligned with the climate focus of the school and sustainability. UBC being a powerhouse for research in terms of climate action, you are seeing all of those teams evolving and uh, intricated into the program as well. So these are just a few. Our alumni should be coming soon as well to for a panel, and you should be asking them how those teams have helped them accelerate their careers. Thank you. Yeah, and I will say this, I did my program, I graduated in 2011. MBA program is a completely new program now. Like it's very different and I wish, I bug Darren all the time to let me do it again, but he won't. Um, so do we have any questions from online so we can switch? We don't forget about them. Awesome. For the MBA program, if they're interested in the marketing and branding, what specialized tracks they should choose and what kind of careers they can get into after that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, well, that's a loaded question. Um, so there is a specific track um, actually for um, this type of roles um, that you can actually choose. But we see a lot of students choosing they want to do a little bit of here, a little bit of there, right? But there, there is a track. There is also a brand management mentorship program, for example, that students can apply to with Professor Tim Silk. That's very popular. Um, I'd say some of the people choose to go to Toronto for some of those roles where the big organizations are. So it just, it just really depends on you are interested in tech, you know, then there is opportunities in Vancouver, consumer packaged goods. There is opportunities in Toronto. So it just depends on what your um, circumstances are. Some people want to come and do programming in a wonderful Vancouver, enjoy the life here, you know, meet amazing people. And they're like, okay, I'm going to go to hustle and bustle to a bigger city and then I'm going to come back. So we see all sorts of different things, but definitely it's very popular, especially among the MBA students when it comes to any kind of marketing and brand management. So you're asking how has the MBA program evolved from a perspective of AI tools and their usage and, and uh, further careers? So that is actually at every university, that is a huge conversation right now. Are we gonna, how are we going to actually let students use AI tools ethically right because we all know with the ai there are some ethical issues so we actually had i was a part of um, a huge discussion we had some amazing panelists from across university where there were people from law faculty computer science you know just take chat gpt it was trained on information that's out there but they didn't ask for permission right so it was a lot of data so whose data is used how is being used whose voices are heard whose voices are not heard right are you going to let your data, as you're going to be using ChatGPT, actually let them provide for further training, right? So we actually have a language now and we have um, courses where professors are literally building cases on AI and allowing students to AI. And there are some courses that are fundamental that you actually need to do stuff without AI to think that you're not going to be able to use it, right? My question is geared, geared more towards how has... How has the MBA program evolved to use the AI tools once we go in and you know into the industry and take up leadership roles? 
you know, traditionally, uh, a CEO would look at a lot of data and then make a decision. Mm -hmm. I think there are some AI tools out there already. But now an AI can actually tell the CEO, okay, this is the decision you need to make, mm -hmm. right? So his job is kind of downsized. So how is the MBA actually evolving for an economy and for, you know, all these processes like decision making and all of these that we would encounter in the industry after after the program? Well, and this is exactly where you're going to be learning these things into the in a classroom, right? Every professor, it depends on how they want to teach you those tools. So every class is going to be actually different, right? But absolutely, the AI is part of, you know, the future decision making. And at the same time, you might be encountering the case, okay, AI is telling me this, but actually this decision should be made this, right? So through case methodology, through, you know, I know that for example, for M-bands, the professors are creating cases where you will be encountering them in the real life, right? So it just really depends on which professor is gonna use it in which way. It's entirely up to them. You cannot regulate um, the freedom that the academics have of how they're gonna teach you. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah thank you. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a comment. Here. Right next to you, yeah. Oh. Um, I think you had a slide where you talked about what companies are looking for in like future employees. And a lot of the things were like creative thinking and critical thinking and sort of um, abstract or sort of subjective kind of things. How would you recommend that like um, that? How would you demonstrate or express that to companies that you have those and like maybe prove it to them or how would they look for those in like a job search perspective? Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you. yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, a lot of the employers are going to put you through multiple rounds of interviews, right? It's not just gonna be, oh, here is one interview and you're done. So many of you will have pre-screen, then you will have a behavioral interview, and then you might have practical interview. I know companies who do like eight rounds. I was just talking to one of our students who was going into venture capital, and they had nine rounds of interviews. So they will make sure that every step of the way, you, let me give you an example, consulting, right? A lot of, lot of graduate students are interested in consulting. You will have to do like, you know, they will test you. They will do company info session. You will have to go and network with them. They will have delegates who will talk to you. After the session, they often actually have a debrief. What did you think of that student? Can they tell their story? Were they having a good body language? Were they um, you know, sophisticated in how they communicated, right? Some companies won't even allow to apply or won't even consider your application if you didn't go into their company info session, right? Then you will be invited, you will have a behavioral interview, maybe with your hiring manager, maybe somebody from HR, and then you're gonna go into case, right? It might be a 24 hour case, it might be like two hour case. That is, for example, for consulting, a number one thing that our employers are telling us, students fail on cases. And it's not only um, consulting companies who are using cases these days. So, but a standard is to be prepared for consulting interview, for a case interview, you would have have to done 50 cases, 50, right? So they will actually use all of the tools at their disposal to actually suss out, are you a good candidate for them? Does that help? Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank oh, you. at the back there? Hi, yes, can you hear me? Yes. I, I just wanted to make a comment, actually. I wanna thank you um, for being part of this forum here and everything you've said is on point. I, when you say segue to HR and real life, uh, my colleague Ahmed Ameri represents uh, marketing and I represent human resources, uh, 20 years at Gentai, which we are proud. Uh, we provided scholarships to a lot of the recipients mm -hmm. at UBC. So I wanted to applaud you for letting us be part of this and sharing, she's on point, real time, all these things that's happening. These are the things I look for when I'm hiring and all the hiring managers. So continued learning, being able to adapt, the flexibility. And one way to demonstrate it is through experience and just volunteer and you know, share and socialize and network, it's all important. So I just wanted to thank you very much for allowing us to be part of this and that we could see from behind the scenes what's going on and the, the programs that you're offering to help us have great leaders to build a better future. Awesome. So, thank you for coming. You. That is really great to hear because you will see a lot of companies when you're going to be here as students, 
in the CPA hall where you are registering, you know, there will be booths in there. You can come and talk to them, right? You know, have a conversations without them. What are they looking for? What do they need, right? Without having relationships in Canada, um, getting a job is really, really hard, right? You really have to go out there and build relationships with people and really think about what do you have to offer to them. And I can guarantee you, here is the thing. Every one of you is unique. Every one of you have got something to offer that I don't have. Everybody here knows something I don't know. You just we, we will help you to figure out what it is and how can you really actually position yourself, but you will have to do that work. Okay, Nicole, are we at time or? I think we have time for one or two one more, more questions. Yeah? Okay. So yeah, please feel free. Okay. There was some over here, I'll go get this. All right, back there, awesome. Hi, thank you so much. I had a question regarding the cases that you were talking about. Could you just elaborate? What do you mean by that? Are you talking a case study? that the employer is asking the potential candidate? Yeah, absolutely. So some of you might have known that case studies are one of the major tools in business schools for learning, right? So um, a lot of them are actually written by Harvard. And, you know, many of you also know that Harvard only teaches through case methodology. So basically you can have, let's say, a case written about Dell or PNG about the problems that they needed to solve, right? Um, some of the cases are, focused on marketing. Some of the cases are focused on operations. Some of the cases are focused on finance. There is, um, for example, when you're doing case interviews, there is a lot of mental math that you have to do. So that's what I mean kind of like by learning cases or doing, um, doing cases. A lot of other organizations like, you know, Telus uses it. Um, for example, L'Oreal is a big organization. They're out in Montreal. Um, they don't even hire through regular kind of like stream, for example, how they hire is um, they choose people who do their brand um, storm, like the big brand competition that students actually participate in. They offer them internships and then you convert internships if you're good into your full-time job. So everybody does it a little bit differently, but cases are a major tool. Pretty much in every class, you will have a case that you will have to do case either as a team or individually. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Do we have any um, questions online? All good. Yeah. Yeah. One more. Okay. Let's do. We'll uh, end it with you. Yeah. It just kind of philosophical question a little bit. So you know, like every year, thousands of people being graduated as MBAs and so on. I feel it's like because we have little time on this earth that it's the best potential to actually explore what we actually can provide for each other. How can we help the economy, community, and so on? So I'm mean, interested to know more about the workshop, the career workshop and the tools that are being provided to the candidate, to the, to the students so they can explore their potential actually and they're finding their career goals and so on yeah. and they're calling actually the market. Yeah, absolutely. So for each of the master program, it's a little bit different. So for example, for full-time MBA, we do workshops. You do not have credited courses for your career. So you have something that we call career development week um, where we kind of like start with you in, in the fall as you start your program. Um, and we will give you workshops that we feel that as a, we tie everything to the career development model. What are the things that you need to know? And then, of course, you have dedicated career coaches and you have unlimited access to them. So that's your main kind of like person that will help you kind of like get where you need to go. They will provide introductions for you. They will help you with exercises, right? For the PMBA, for the professional MBA, it's directly embedded in your residencies. Plus, again, you have a dedicated coach that you can go to anytime. MBA programs, they have to do mandatory intake. So basically, we will get to know you as a person. Where are you at? We will do an assessment and then we'll, okay, what do you think? Some, so here is the thing. Some people will come there like, yep, this is what I want to do. This is where I want to change my career. Some people are like, nope. I'm a discoverer. I'm an explorer. Some people will say, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going to use my entire MBA to develop my business idea. And it's actually a good one. When my classmate did it, we were all his guinea pigs and his volunteers. Um, so it, it's different for everybody. For MBAN and MM, Master Management, you have credited courses um, for career. You have to do it no matter what. So um, we work with you throughout the entire time and on certain topics. So there is workshops on how to do an amazing resume and cover letter. You were asking about um, AI. We are actually now got rid of uh, a tool that we were using and we are actually creating guidelines of how students can use AI to actually uh, create a really good resume and cover letter for free, right? Without, without 
um, you know, paying for a certain tool. There is going to be stuff on emotional intelligence, relationship building and networking, um, salary negotiation, right? Um, we will have each and every one of you have our business development team to give you market information about certain industries. So, so there is a ton, right? Um, so there are components and alongside all of that are the career coaches that are going to be dedicated to you and they're going to basically guide you along the way. So is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And with that, we will end. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a wonderful lunch. Go and talk to people you haven't met. Make some new friends. Okay. You never know where your next opportunity is going to come from. Have a great day. Bye. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today, both in person and virtually. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, my name is Natalie Sarestra-Phil, and I'm a recruitment and admissions manager. So I hope you can find me later today for any questions you might have admissions related. Um, but I'd like to welcome you all for the our university alumni panel Q&A session. And this occasion represents a unique opportunity to bring together the wisdom and experiences of our esteemed alumni with the aspirations and curiosity of our prospective students. Our university has a rich history and our alumni have played an integral role in shaping it. They have ventured into diverse fields, achieving remarkable success and have carried the values and knowledge instilled here into the wider world and business context. Today, we are honored to have a distinguished group of alumni who have graciously agreed to share their insights, stories, and advice with us. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you, thank you, Kai, Kevin, and Jeremy for being with us today. Uh, can I get a little golf clap for our panelists? Thank you. Um, now I'd like to get each of them to please introduce themselves. Um, could you please start with your full name, the program that you did at the university, your year of graduation, and the current role that you hold? Absolutely. So can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. I am Amrita Agarwal. I did the Master of Management program here at Sauter. I graduated in 2020. And right now I'm working as an equity and inclusion strategist with Backout Consulting. So we do work in diversity, equity and inclusion and human rights consulting. Thank you, Amrita. Hello, everyone. My name is Kai. I am with I graduated from the full time MBA class of 2022. And I'm currently the senior strategy advisor at WorkSafe BC. I joined WorkSafe BC about four months ago. And prior to that, I was a senior consultant with IBM. So lovely to meet you all. Thank you, Kai. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kevin Lee. I am a, I graduated from the UBC professional MBA class of 2022. Um, I'm currently a merchant success manager at Shopify, um, where I help our enterprise merchants grow their businesses online. Hi, everybody. My name is Jeremy Moxie. I'm a 2019 graduate of the MBAN program, and I'm currently a senior data analyst at FreshBooks. Thank you all for the introductions. Um, I have a list of questions that um, our alumni frequently get, so I'll work my way through some of them, but I'll ask that you think about your own questions as well throughout the session so that you can definitely ask away um, once we're through getting the, once we're through getting the, through a few of the questions. Um, so whether they're virtual or in person, um, make sure you've got some great questions for our alum. So I'll kick us off with the first one. Um, and any volunteers for this one? Um, how do you know it? How did you know it was the right time in your career to apply to business school? <laughs> I can start. So um, I did my bachelor's in English literature. And it was amazing. I studied critical race theory, cure theory, so much, right? Um, but when I graduated, I suddenly came to this realization that people do not want to hire arts graduates right off the bat. And I did some jobs, but I wasn't really happy in it. I was doing some marketing and sales and um, consulting, and that wasn't speaking to me. Um, so I had reached out to um, somebody at Sauter. Um, I don't even remember. It was so many years ago. Um, and they talked through, talked about the program. They told me that, you know, you come, you, you'll find out what you want to be doing. You don't have to make a decision. Just come experience the life here. 
and I was like, okay, like this is a time in my life where there's so much ambiguity. Uh, maybe it is time to do a business degree and find for myself where do I fit in into this world. And that's how I knew. Thank you, Amrita. Um, for myself, I would say that it was a function of desiring to move to a different country and move to a different industry. So I'm originally born and raised in Singapore and um, fell in love with the North American life and um, decided to get my Canadian PR. And at that point in my career, my trajectory has always been, has always been marketing and communications. Really wanted to go into consulting, explore corporate strategy, and the MBA really opened doors in that area. I was able to then pivot to consulting, which I fell deeply in love with. And now I am doing internal consulting, if you will, for the public sector with WorkSafe. Thank you for sharing that experience, Kai. Uh, so for me, I think uh, I actually needed to pivot. So I went to business school straight out of undergrad. Um, I'm not sure if that's still a thing these days, but uh, for me, I studied engineering as an undergraduate student and I hated it. Um, so I wanted to shift to do something else where I could still solve problems, but in a different way and from a different perspective. And I thought that business school would give me the skills and the opportunities to do that. So that's what I did. And I think it paid off uh, for the better. Um, I'm a lot happier than I was before. So that's a big upside for me. Um, my journey into business school is a little different. Um, so I actually used to work for Solder. Um, so I used to work uh, on the recruitment and admissions team alongside Natalie and many of the staff members that you see today. Um, so I knew a lot about the business school. Obviously, I talked to quite a few alumni um, during my years working here as a staff member. Um, I don't have a similar to Jeremy. I, you know, I don't have a traditional background in business school. I have an arts degree. So I knew that if I wanted to excel in my career and jump to different opportunities, I wanted to gain that business acumen. So I wanted that foundation um, in proper business training. And so that's why I decided to go into um, business school and actually take on the, the PMBA program. Thank you so much, Kevin. And thank you all for answering that question so well. <laughs> Uh, so our next question brings me to how did your experience at UBC Solder shape your career and choices? Were there any specific skills or experiences from your business education that helped you in your early career stages? Go first. Go for it. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, I had a lot of, uh, you know, exposure to higher education. I'd worked for at that point about I think it was about six years in higher education. And so the, the program really helped me open up different career paths. It helped me, it allowed me to see different options that I had um, in my journey. And I actually made the transition over to tech. So going from higher education to tech is a pretty unorthodox move, I would say. So if anyone here is looking at, you know, the MBA program, full-time or professional MBA, as an opportunity to switch your career paths, that is certainly an avenue that you can take. So I would say it, it helped open up a, a lot of doors for me. Um, one of the main reasons why I actually ended up working at Shopify was my network that I built here in the PMBA program. So one of my colleagues at the time was working at Shopify too. So they provided me with that referral. I was able to do quite a bit of coffee chats with people um, from different industries within the class itself. Um, so I would say that the program really did open up many different avenues for me and, and help me make that transition from one industry to another. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you so much for highlighting the importance of an alumni network, because that is one of the true values of, of business school, really. Would anyone else like to add Kevin's answer? Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, similar to what Kevin said. Um, so I came from a culture where we don't do networking. That is not something that's ever taught to us or even expected uh, when we're applying for jobs. But when you start applying jobs here in Canada, you'll soon realize that it's really impossible to keep sending your resumes and cover letters and don't hear back from anybody. I maybe applied for 200, 300 jobs before I heard back. But to be honest, like all the jobs that I've had since coming here, have been through my network and it's all because of Sauter because I met somebody who spoke to me and we built relationships and that's kind of what Sauter teaches you more than what you learn in accounting and finance all that's great if you're interested um, but it's more important to build those relationships and the network at Sauter like people will vouch for you if you're here they know that 
you are here because you're passionate about what Sauter does, what we do here um, about, you know, business, about the school. And here there's so many opportunities to give back as well. Even throughout the program, there are opportunities to help you build your leadership skills, your relationship skills, your networking skills. Um, and I think that was really helpful for me to get any job since graduating. Thank you, Amrita. Um, I would also completely agree and echo the sentiments of Amrita and Kevin. I would say that the the career center here at Sauter is second to none. I got my first role um, with IBM. The doors opened for me because of a networking session that I attended through the career center. And I then secured my, my position um, leading strategy management at WorkSafe BC through a counterpart who graduated with me with the, at the program and she did her internship at WorkSafe BC and she gave me a referral. So doors organically open um, and the foundation that the BC Career Center gives you and the, the, the courses that really give you the general skill sets to excel in an interview as an example um, really does make a difference. Thank you, Kai. Um, I suppose that approach from the classroom side of things, I would say that the problem solving skills that you gain in UBC sort of um, are exceptionally useful. And it's something that I carried with me throughout my first job and second job and my current job and through interviews and just gaining the ability to break a problem down from the top level all the way down into the details significantly helped me. And it's something that I did get to practice as well. Um, through the use of the career center, which I use a lot for interview prep. Um, so I'd say SOT has a lot of tools educationally and extra benefits as well, like the career center that help you get to the point where you need to be, where you're in interviews and get in job offers and successfully into your careers after completing business school. Thank you very much. And thank you all for highlighting the importance of leveraging all the, the toolkit that we have at the school. Definitely. Um, and now I'm going to ask a question that came uh, online from our online attendees. So thank you for that question. Um, and the question is, how did you manage the PMBA coursework demands with your job? How demanding was the course? <laughs> I think this is a question that a lot of people ask. So a, a fair one, nonetheless. Yeah, so I came into the PMBA knowing that even though I had the full support of my team um, here at Sauter, that I needed to really craft a lot of time in my personal life and dedicate that to the PMBA. So I came into the program with a goal of, you know, doing quite well in the uh, within the PMBA program um, academically, and I, I knew I wanted to make use of all the resources here. So one of the first things that I did was actually communicate with friends and family to say you know, th these are my boundaries. Like there are going to be some times where I don't actually come out to stuff. There are some times where I really need to dedicate my evenings to the PMBA coursework and just really sit down and, and study. Um, I think it's also important as you're navigating this journey to have a discussion with your employers and your team members. Um, they should technically know that you're doing a program on the side. So you should probably have a discussion with them to say, you know, maybe it's about dedicating, you know, maybe if you're used to working weekends, um, maybe some weekends you don't work, or maybe there are some ways you can shift your schedule around. Um, generally, when you start the program, they'll give you a list of dates that you would have to keep in mind um, for mandatory classes. So you would probably want to communicate with your employers and let them know and just set those boundaries right away. Um, I think it's also the mindset that you go into the program with, right? Like, Obviously, everyone wants to do well academically in the program. You get what you get. You get what you give into the program. So think about how much time you're willing to dedicate. Think about the fact that there are networking opportunities outside of the class itself that you can really put yourself into. Um, and I think if you go in with a very specific mindset and understanding of what you want to get out of the program, um, you can set those boundaries very, very clearly. I hope Thank I you, Kevin. Thanks very much. And I guess my next question would be, how would you, how have you approached, approached career advancement and seeking new opportunities within your organization or in different companies? Uh, because whether you're in the PMBA or the MBA or the, the MM or the MBAN, um, we've just demonstrated, we've just seen how 
much people's roles transition and shift into different areas, whether it's industries or uh, hierarchies within the organization. So what has that experience been like for you all? Who'd like to take that one first? Jeremy's the courageous one here. <laughs> uh, so I would say that in terms of career advancement, I think you need to be there. You need to be very intentional about your goals. Um, you need to be having those conversations with your manager and saying, this is what I intend to do for myself in this current year or in the next however many years. And this is also where I want to be in the next however many years. And you need to set those goals and make those goals clear to uh, the key stakeholders around you. Because um, I would say that people do need to know that you exist. They need to know the work that you're doing. They need to know what results you bring in and what value you add to the company. Um, so I would say the networking skills that you would gain in SOTA would definitely help in that. So it's not just about networking outside of your circle and to get ground and footing into like companies that you want to get into. But even when you're inside a company already, you need to network with those around you as well. Thank you, Jeremy. I think Jeremy brought up a really good word there and the word there is value. Um, you really want to look at the value you bring to a potential role that you want to be a part of. Um, you also want to explore the fact that as you change roles, what does it mean for your career trajectory? Um, for me, marketing communications was sort of my lifeblood for seven to eight years. And that transition to corporate strategy um, is not um, the most common track that people in marketing communications do. But my time in the MBA really gave me the skill sets and the um, the social know-hows to, to navigate the space in terms of pitching your best self to a department or to a trajectory that is completely unfamiliar um, right off the bat. So that was my approach essentially to career changes. Thank you, Kai. And it looks like we have some great questions coming up from the audience. So I'll now turn things over to the audience for, for any questions. Um, there's a question here from, I think it's Laura, isn't it? Nice to um Here, uh, someone will walk around now with the mic. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, Laura. Yeah, uh, my question is to those who uh, weren't working uh, while uh, taking the programs. Uh, so how long did it take you to land on a good job after graduation? And uh, through the networking, did you have every time to uh, write a cover letter through your networking and getting references? Thank you. Thank you, Lara. Akita. So the question, if I understood it correctly, and you can elaborate, Laura, was around how long it took you to secure a job after graduation and what the type of support look like, looked like in securing those opportunities and how much the alumni network was a support in that. That quickly. So for me personally, I found a job before graduation. So I secured my career transition into a new position um, in November 2021. So before I graduated, um, you know, I made use of the, the networking resources. Um, I was navigating a new industry. So I really wanted to know, you know, what were the salary expectations? So I really relied on my career coach at the time to tell me, okay, what are salary expectations? You know, if I'm navigating a career pivot, what can I try to negotiate here? Um, what is the leverage that I have? Um, so that was my journey in finding a new career in terms of like writing the cover letter and whatnot. Um, I did that on my own. I think I ran it by my career coach very quickly. Um, but the resume and the cover letter, um, that sort of technical piece, um, they do quite a bit of different workshops and there's different toolkits that you can gain access to to do that on your own time. So it was more so like I think the conversational pieces um, the negotiation piece, that was the thing I really relied on my career coach to help me with. Um, so my case was a little bit different. So I graduated in the middle of the pandemic, uh, which was a very terrible time to graduate. And there were no jobs. And when I said there were no jobs, there weren't any at that time. However, even before graduating, I still got a job. And that was all because of networking. And the job did not exist. 
So somebody created that job because of the network and they let me into the company. So that's really how powerful networking is and how powerful Sauter Network is um, because it was actually an alumni, uh, alumni of the school who, um, who offered that job to me. So I'd say network, 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 and we cannot emphasize that enough. Thank you, Rita. I secured my job um, six months before graduation. And so that sort of gave me a runway a little bit to um, deal with, you know, salary negotiations, you know, conversations around um, my my actual start date. So, you know, some people take a couple of months after graduation for a bit of a vacation or for a little bit of international travels, but I pretty much went from um, school immediately into the boardroom. Um, so it was about six months before graduation. And I have to say that the resources here, as echoed by everyone in the panel, made that possible. Thank you all very much for answering Laura's question. And I think we have another question over on this side. Could you please introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Janik. Uh, I just had a quick question. Um, a couple of you touched on it a little bit, but did your goals going into the program change what, while you were in the program? And if so, how did you navigate the change in just goals while during the program? Great question. Thank you. Uh, I suppose I'll take it. Um, I would say for me, yes, my goals did change going into the program and during the program and then also coming out of it. So going into the MBAN program, I think I was just at a point where I wanted to learn new things, but I kind of forgot about the part where I'll need a job afterward. So my goal was still to learn as much as I could in the time that I had, but it also became about trying to find opportunities that I would be interested in and that would be aligned with my career goals as well. And I think I, I, I sort of figured that out as I was going along. So the transition there is one that's pretty natural in a sense that as you learn new things, you know, you start applying those skills and you get a feel for what you like and what you don't like and what you're, what you're interested in and what you're not interested in. And you kind of look for opportunities that align with what you want to do when you finish your program. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, my goals did not change. I went in um, fully aware that I wanted to be in consulting and um, I was very adamant to stick with that path. And therefore, I sought out opportunities that would solidify that trajectory for me. So no changes to my goals. Um, I went into my program in January 2020, and I was ready to do consulting. So I was really going to throw myself into consulting, and my goals radically changed, especially as the pandemic um, made itself known. Um, you know, it, it changed just like the, the work environment. It changed the, the landscape of what we knew in terms of consulting. Um, so a lot of the industry um, networking events that you get exposure to during your time in the program, mine were all online, but I still attended um, all of my networking events. Um, getting to speak with different alumni, it really helped me uh, shift my mindset and helped me pivot quite a bit in my goals. Thank you, Kevin. And thank you all for your wonderful answers to that question. Uh, we have some questions coming up online. So I'm going to hand the mic over to my colleague, Tina, who will take an online question now. Thank you, Natalie. There are some long, long questions. Uh, the first one is, so what was your highlight as a Sauter student? The, the highlight for me was the community that I built. Um, so as I mentioned, I'd worked in higher education for six years. I'd worked for in marketing for about two years before that. So my networks were very like they were very insular. Like it was, it was sort of like an echo chamber, you know, like I wanted to know more about different industries and know, you know, what different trends were in the business world. And so for me, being able to speak with people within Vancouver and in different parts of BC who were part of completely different industries um, was a huge, huge, huge benefit for me. So that was the highlight for me. I, I've made great friends in the program. Um, I'm actually going to go speak I'm actually going to have dinner with some friends tonight. Uh, you know, we have a WhatsApp group going on. Um, we celebrate each other's, you know, anniversaries and, and help celebrate each other's wins. So I would say the community that you build, even just within the PMBA itself, despite it being a local program, um, is fantastic. Like that was a huge highlight for me. 
Um, if I can add to that, I think the biggest highlight for me was learning resilience as a skill. Um, because, you know, when you come into this program, you do not expect how tiring, how time consuming, um, how exhausting it's going to be. And on top of that, you're networking. On top of that, you're doing your cover letter resume. On top of that, you have to also be part of executive councils or like some clubs, anything to boost up your resume. So I was exhausted. I was tired, but I learned like what resilience looks like. And um, I had those conversations with Martina and Darren and everybody, and they're all so supportive. They'll have those conversations with you. And I think the openness with which they guide you, that was a highlight for me to learn that skill, to be resilient and to keep going and also to rest. Rest is also okay, but when you're in the program, there is no time for rest. Um, but afterwards, you know, you get to do that. Um, the next question, there are a lot of questions. I'm just gonna limit it to a couple. Like I, I know we have a limited time today. Um, this question is specific to, to Kai about the MBA program. So how do you choose the career track? How did I choose my career track? Um, for me, it was a little bit, unique in that I went into the program wanting to go into consulting. And I knew that, um, you know, the, there was a really strong network of consultants um, from Sauter who are, you know, in, you know, the big three in Deloitte, IBM, um, KPMG, you name it, they, they, we've got representation there. So um, in terms of tracks, I would say that I took a custom track where it was an amalgamation of you know, um, tech analytics, it was amalgamation with marketing communications, um, general strategy. And that gave me, really positioned me very well as a generalist to go into consulting. And I think one of the, the, the for context, when you go into consulting, um, I think being a generalist positions you well because you get exposed to a lot of different industries. You're not pigeonholed to a specific sector should you um, join a consulting firm. So, I decided to take the, the custom track just because I, I knew that was how it would position me moving forward. And I'll just say like very quickly from my knowledge of the programs and speaking with other universities, the custom track at UBC is quite unique. Like it is one of the, I think we are one of the few MBA programs that offers the ability to customize your career track in the full-time MBA. Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Um, last question from Alan. I'll pass the floor to Natalie again um, about funding for startups. I'm not sure any of you had experience and how can the alumni community help someone who is interested in entrepreneurship? Um, so I run a bookbinding business on the side um, and I actually started doing it with a with a person who came here for a networking opportunity. They're not a Sauter alumni, but they came to talk to us about something really random. And we built a conversation. We met for coffee chats. Um, and that was four years ago. And when I wanted to get into this space, this is a side business, not a startup or anything, um, they were there. And they helped me fund it. They helped, they support, supported me. They provide mentorship for this um, th thing that I'm doing. And they're not a Sauter alumni, but still they are open to it because they came to our networking session still. So take those opportunities. You never know where something's going to come from, really. I think I'll also mention that um, there are incubators on campus. So I, I don't have personal experience with this. I'm just going back in my last job and thinking about what I used to talk to students about. Um, so there's E at UBC, entrepreneurship at UBC. And then I believe that there's still the Hatch Tech Incubator. Um, so there are different resources on campus um, where, you know, you might have to enter a program. You might want to talk with uh, different professionals here. Um, and I would say that UBC is a really thriving environment for startups. Um, I think Kai's internship was done as a startup that was founded by a PMBA. Um, so that's one ways that's one of the ways that like startups can give back to the UBC community um, through internships. Uh, there's many different opportunities and job opportunities that you can also get to. In terms of funding, you might want to talk and, and speak with different programs and incubators here on campus. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. And I'll just add to that as well. Um, for anyone who's interested in the entrepreneurial route, um, there is a pretty large um, proportion of MBAs who do pursue an MBA because they're looking to kind of get that solid business foundation so that they can get their wonderful creative idea off the ground. So in addition to getting the, the programming and the specializations within the entrepreneurial track, there's also entrepreneurial projects that you'll engage in. So during the summer months, while a lot of the other career tracks are participating in internships, you will have the opportunity to get your business plan and your business project off the ground, um, leveraging a lot of our, our in-house resources, our connections and our partnerships. Uh, and of course, in conjunction with the resources that, that Kevin mentioned as well for, uh, through uh, entrepreneurship at UBC and The Hatch. Um, and also because a lot of individuals pursuing specialty master's programs or MBAs are typically drawn to the consulting space. I wanted to put a spotlight on the SEMP. The SEMP is the Strategic Consulting Mentorship Program. This is essentially, I call it kind of like a boot camp for, for anyone who wants to get into the consulting space. So what that program looks like is essentially it's something that you would join alongside being in, in one of our programs, but you're working with consultants and specialists in that field so that you can get um, to a level where you're ready to be put in front of those, um, those organizations, those major consultancy firms, like the KPMGs of the world and the PWCs of the world, for instance. So that's for anyone into the consulting space. And I see a hand raised over there, the gentleman in the... Pink. Hi, my name is Bassem. Thank you for your insights. So um, before you joined, we were filling these forms that Martina shared with us. And obviously all of us, we had some soft skills to work on. So my question to you, was there anything that you weren't very confident about before joining the program and that dramatically changed after you graduated? Great question. I think for me, I wanted to really brush up on my financial acumen. Um, you know, being in marketing communications and wanting to go into corporate strategy, <clears throat> essentially, it's it's more of a generalist route. So um, took really solid finance courses. Financial acumen is significantly better than when before the program. Um, and I also just wanted to echo what uh, Natalie said, the SCMP. Um, I went through that and it's the best investment I made in my life. The The skills that stay with you, especially those who want to go into consulting, is 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 it's a lifelong commitment and it's an incredible um hit hit start for you if you want to do that space. So financial acumen was an area that needed work and I'm glad I worked on it. Thank you, Kai. We have a few more questions from the audience. Perfect. Um the gentleman in the gray shirt. Following up on the previous question, uh in terms of soft skills and personality, um, uh, you know. I'd like to hear maybe from one or all of you, you know, what was the biggest change and what was one of the soft skills that uh, you felt that, you know, you were weak on, but, you know, it, it, the MBA tremendously helped you there. Uh, for me, it was, I worked really hard. Um, so I actually um, work with a leadership coach um, at Sauter and you can all do that too, um, to refine my leadership skills because as a leader, I, like when I came into the program, I was not like affirmative or I wasn't like assertive at all. Um, but with the work that I did with my leadership coach, I worked on all of those skills to be more assertive, to be clear in my communication, to be more of a people leader and realize like, how can I lead my team um, to a better future? So that was the biggest skill that I worked on. Thank you, Amrita. Thank you. And what I will add to that quickly is whether you're in the MM program or the MBA program or whatnot, with the Business Career Center, you do an assessment early on. And I think Martina likely spoke about this, but essentially you help spot early on, what are my strengths and what are the areas that I can definitely develop and work upon? And so during the program, you work with your coach to get stronger in those areas. And so that's one of the, the, the values of the BCC as well, you would gain. A few more questions here, please go ahead. Alex, yeah. you might wanna shout your question up or mic there. 
Go ahead, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. Um, so my question is obviously for all of you, but specifically mostly for Amrita, not to put you on the spot because I also have a BA in English. Um, were there any skills that you came into the program not knowing that you had and ended up developing more than you'd expected to? Um, yeah, so I think like it was about presentation skills. And I know that sounds really tricky, but when you go into consulting, you'll realize that nobody there cares. Your clients, people that you work with don't care about the data um, that you're presenting. They care. What does this data mean for you? And that's kind of the scale that I developed at Sauter. Like, how do you communicate that? How do you tell people, well, what's the impact this is going to have on you? And I feel like when you come from an arts degree, that's really hard skill to manage. Like first you learn data and then you learn, um, you know, how to like analyze that data. But then that's not the end. It's the communication part. Hard. how do you present it that's most important I think that's a skill that like with so many presentations and you have to do presentations for all the courses you learn that you have to learn it and I think that really helped me in my career and like like yeah my clients like don't see the data but they see what's the impact like that's going to have on their people on the recruitment or whatever they're doing so that's what I would say Thank you, Marita. And that's, you know, that's the power of storytelling. It's it's not a buzzword. It's it's really what you learn to apply in the program as well. Um, I think we have some questions online that we'll be getting to as well. So again, I'll hand the mic over to Tina to ask those online questions. Thank you, Natalie. Um, thank you to our alumni. How will UBC help you to connect to others after you graduated? anyone can share. So I'll take it. I just missed the last part of the question. You said, how does UBC connect to... UBC Solder or UBC in general help you to connect with others after you graduate from UBC? Uh, so there was a question previously about how long it took to find a job after graduation. And I'll say for me, it was about two weeks. Um, I started before... I started looking before graduating, but I will say that the UBC and the UBC sort of brand helps a lot, um, especially in the Vancouver area in the BC uh, community. Um, it's a very well-known brand and people do want to work with people that come from UBC sort of, I'll just put it that simply. Oh boy. Well, time sure does fly when you're engaged in some great conversation. I think I can hear some stomach scrumbling from up there. Uh, so that brings us to a close for our alumni panel session. But please make sure that when you're at lunch or when we're all out there in the networking reception that you don't be shy, come up, ask for questions, whether it's to the recruitment team, the staff, the alumni or, or faculty, we're all here to support you in answering any questions you might have. Uh, so we look forward to kind of engaging with each and every one of you over a, a few nice bites to eat. I'm just going to hand things over to Nicole before we break uh, for lunch. I think there's some prize updates that she'll fill us in on. So so thanks again for the uh, for being here. And can we get a round of applause for our panel? Thank you. Fantastic. And I'm actually going to hand the mic over to Tina. She's just going to get her computer set up. Um, but one more round of applause for our alumni. So I'll pass it over to Tina to wrap us up for the day and share a few important reminders. Um, and you have your slides all here. There you go. Hello, everyone. My name is Tina. You probably have met me through the fairs and through uh, the coffee chat. So here's me again. And thanks so much for coming today. I know you all are pretty hungry and, and trying to get to the lunch set up upstairs. So before we head up there and just some reminders for you, the application deadlines here, so some domestic application deadlines here. Um, and next slide, if you can take a picture, please do. Just to remember, we do offer GMAT GRE waiver uh, requests. So if you are hoping to submit that, make sure you, uh, for dom domestic applications, need to submit by May 7th next year, 2024, and January 9th for international applications. This is the international application deadlines. If you want to take a picture as well, please do. 
Um, in the meantime, I do want to um, say, express our sincere gratitude for your participation today. Your uh, engagement really made this day special. And I also want to thank you, our staff from the recruitment admissions, our dean, our associate, senior associate dean, Joey, and also assistant dean here in Fatina, here to um, make this day even better. And also that I hope you learned some insights today as well from your sessions um, and are eager to start your applications soon. Um, and just next slide, please, for the BMM applications. So if you're interested in the BMM application, which is a bachelor um, and plus master management, please make sure you follow the deadlines here. If you want to take a pictures, please do as well. Yeah. Um, the final um, one is our contact information here. Those are inbox. Um, so if you have general questions about missions process or the programs, please make sure to send the information or question to this inbox. Here's our lovely faces. Uh, I'll just quickly introduce them. My name is Tina. I'm the manager for the full time MBA and PMBA program. Sophie as well for the PMBA and full time MBA program here to support you if you have any questions about MBA programs. And Natalie here is for the MM and BMM, which you just see that she um, she was a moderator for the alumni panel discussion. Thanks, Natalie. And Vivian, actually Vivian is in Africa right now and she's online. So we'll say hi, Vivian. Thanks so much for uh, answering all the questions online. She's our BMM Ben and MBM Ben dual do degree uh, lead uh, manager for the rec uh, under recruitment admissions. Nicole here is um, our senior manager for the team, and Rodrigo as well. And here is our director of recruitment admissions. And I also want to uh, have a shout to all the staff members here today who are supporting our sessions and this wonderful day. Um, and actually, Jeremy just welcomed the baby boy yesterday, so he couldn't be here in person. But um, thanks to all the staff members. So here's the conclude of the sessions. But I also want to say bye to um, our online audience before we get into the uh, lucky drawer. Um, and also that if you want to learn more about events, please make sure you take a picture of this. Okay, so I'll say bye to our online audience before I get into the lucky drawer. Thank you so much for all the attendees online. Hopefully you will get to your application soon, okay?